Just this last week, as you would be aware, Australia voted nearly two to one to be in favor of same-sex marriage. Some Christians on one side of the aisle are scandalized by this decision. Say, man, this is proof positive that, that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Others stand on the other side of the aisle and say, no, 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 no. This is just the kind of magnanimity and equality and egalitarianism that the, the, the society has been striving towards since the medieval period. And wherever you personally come down on that, whether you favor the religious liberty side and say, well, look, these people aren't Bible-believing Christians. We shouldn't impose our religious construct upon them. Maybe you're on that side of the aisle, or maybe you're on this side of the aisle where you say, well, no, wait a minute. The family unit is biologically sacred, and it is institutionally sacred, and it should be protected. Here's the point. What you cannot do on either side of the aisle is color everybody else on the other side of the aisle with the same brush. It, it doesn't work that way. This is a nuanced issue. It's an issue in which culture is running headlong into a brave new world. Frankly, they don't know where they're going. I mean, and you can't blame them. People who are not rooted in Scripture, people who have lost the moral moorings of the basic identity of gender, right? Where are you running? We don't know, but we're going very fast. Right? Right? We can critique a direction that is unbiblical. We can evaluate decisions that are farcical and contrary to basic nature and biology. Yes, we can do that. What we cannot do is say that all of the people who adhere to that perspective, all of the people who are, who are sympathetic to that perspective, are summarily lost, are summarily wicked, are summarily evil, are summarily delinquent. We cannot say that. You can do the first, not the second. Jesus says, don't judge by appearances, just judge correctly. Yes, have an open mind, but not so open that your brain tips out. Can you say amen? This is a great opportunity for the church to practice what it preaches when it comes to evaluating culture and not condemning individual people. Can we critique the prevailing culture? Of course we can. We would be delinquents in our responsibilities if we didn't critique the prevailing culture. The prophets critiqued the prevailing culture. The disciples pr pr uh, critiqued the prevailing culture. Jesus cr cr critiqued the prevailing culture. I'll, I'll say this. I've not said this publicly. I've said it in a few private conversations. I got, I got, I got news for you. The church always did best when it was a politically insignificant and persecuted minority. The church always did best when it was a politically insignificant and persecuted minority. And so if the tide of, of prevailing contemporary opinion, if the tide of a godless zeitgeist has swung against the church for a little time right now, don't overreact as some on the, on the uh, evangelical side of the aisle are. Simply say, this is a sign of the times and a little persecution, a little adversity, a little difficulty might just do the church good. Because it might actually start to mean something to take the name of Jesus and to stand in critical but loving evaluation of a culture that has lost its moral moorings. We can critique ideas. We can critique culture. We can even critique behavior. What we cannot do is judge people. That is reserved for God alone, who knows all of the genetic, epigenetic, environmental, cultural, psychological, social factors that make people what they uniquely are.